Hi, this is Reed Bailey, and this is a short presentation of problem identification. The first step in the system modology as presented by Gibson, Shearer, and Gibson in how to do systems analysis. On this slide, I'll introduce some terms that we'll use in this presentation and map them to some of the terms used in Gibson, Shearer, and Gibson. We can think about the first phase of activities being discovery. But in particular, the step we'll be looking at, um, step one in Gibson Shear in Gibson goal development is part of discovery. Also, step two is. Creation is alternative generation from Gibson Shear and Gibson. Convergence really focuses on the ranking from Gibson Shear and Gibson. And proposal is all about the action step. And you'll see where iteration comes in in a minute. Particular words that we're going to use in this presentation are problem identification focus of this presentation, problem formulation, the other major step in discovery, and then you can see some of the other major uh, steps within each of the phases just introduced. Alternative generation, evaluation, prioritization, and recommendations. Particular components or activities you might be involved with with each step are now shown. In this video in particular, we'll look at problem identification with generalizing the problem and root cause analysis, as is in 2B scenarios, information gathering, uh, and diagramming and process modeling. Now, all of this process is presented in a way in which, even though it looks linear on the layout here, we really want to be encouraging an um, uh, uh, approach that embraces error, where you're willing to move forward with uncertainty to let your recommendations and designs evolve to explore ideas, use that to learn, and then go back and be willing to change your ideas later. This iteration and iterative culture as presented on this slide is really a key part of executing a systems approach. Now let's get into the first step of discovery, problem identification. The root question we're trying to answer here is, are we solving the right problem? We're going to hit the real high points on this and give you one example on this presentation. The fundamental idea behind generalizing the problem in root cause analysis is that the client does not understand his or her own problem. Uh, they're going to tend to have a more narrow idea of what the problem is, um, may even just be a symptom, and they're going to want to come to you with uh, solutions which may not really be uh, fully encompassing all the dimensions of the problem at hand. Um, root cause analysis, one of the uh, tools people use for that is called the five whys with essentially where you just keep asking why. So if a client comes to you and says that their problem is um, we have to wait too long on the labels that we order for our wine bottles and you can say you know well why do you have to wait so long? Uh, and you might even ask more fundamental questions which are more like well why do you need labels in the first place? Uh, well, why do you order your labels? Why don't you make your labels your, your, yourself? Instead of trying to work on a project where you reduce the wait time for ordering labels, you can reshape the problem into, well, maybe you could make your labels yourself, or maybe you could create um, the labels uh, earlier in the process so you don't have to be waiting for them at the point of their need. Generalizing the problem outscoping the problem is followed by and, and works in tandem with looking at how the current system operates and then how it should operate. Referring to the how the current system operates, this can be called the descriptive scenario or the as is. You want to make sure that you focus not just on the context around the situation, but really the system of interest. Um, all the things that may be leading up to this problem and, and ancillary information aren't as relevant as if your problem is really focused on, for instance, in the last example, um, getting wine shipped as quickly as possible once it's bottled, um, then focus on that. You don't need to focus on the basic um, context of the entire um, wine operation for this company or the wine industry. That'd be another type of analysis, but not really part of a descriptive scenario. And then clearly you want to do your research for this part. You want to be a rich description that really hits the key information and we're going to have a slide later on about where you can get some of this information. 2B or the normative scenario 
Now this is not a description of the solution. This is not a description of the actual end product, but more of how should it operate? What are some of the characteristics of its operation? We'll give you an example of that in just a minute. Throughout all of this, the uh, stakeholders' viewpoints can be integrated in a, not only the, the descriptive or as-is scenario, but also in the to-be scenario. So instead of maybe having a separate section where you say stakeholder analysis and you write down each stakeholder, you can integrate their perspectives into the as-is and the to-be scenarios. Now, let's look at an example, and this is for a company that is a Cisco training provider, and they had a problem with scheduling their courses. So here's a description of their current situation. Uh, they have two offices, and it takes too much time um, and results in over-scheduling of most courses. The original course schedule, which is created six months prior to classes running, so students can sign up for, for it. Uh, must be changed over several time-intensive iterations to match student de demands. Essentially, if students are signing up or not signing up for courses, they keep adjusting, adding extra sections of a certain course, eliminating other courses. This makes it very difficult for the sales team who's trying to enroll students, it makes it difficult for students who's trying to schedule a, a particular class, and it's really difficult for them to project profits because they don't know how many students are actually going to be able to get in certain courses. Now, what are some types of generalizing the problem questions that you could ask? We mentioned earlier it could be a lot of why questions, but you might see, which we see here initially, why does a schedule need to be generated by SLI in the first place? Why not let the students define the schedule? Maybe they can just sign up on a discussion board and kind of coalesce around times. Um, why, why, why do classes have to have a schedule? Can't they just be offered asynchronously instead of in one place at one time? Um, why not only, instead of offering classes for individual signups, only offer classes to corporations where they have a group of their employees that want to uh, take the class together? And then you avoid this problem altogether. Is the current approach really a problem? So here's a question that's not really a why question, but it really is getting it probing. Is this the real problem? Well, what would you gain by saving time and making the schedule more effectively? Uh, uh, or what would you gain by... Uh, uh, by only scheduling classes that had higher enrollments the first time around. And then, let's say the client had come to you and said, we really want a tool that's going to help make our schedule more quickly. You could ask questions like, well, why do you think a tool will solve all the problems associated with scheduling classes? If they start introducing a particular solution to you, that's a great point where you can say, well, what do you like about that solution? What do you think it's going to accomplish? And that helps you get at the root objectives uh, that they're trying to achieve. The descriptive scenario in this case is a flow chart. And I'm not going to review this whole chart. Um, you can spend time on the slide if you'd like. But I'd like to show you kind of um, the comparison of the descriptive scenario to the ideal s situation. Not only were some of the hours, I can go back and show that, were some of the hours and times and problems with the current situation highlighted, on the next slide we can see that a big part of this um, process flow was replaced with one step. Um, and then a short amount of text, in this case, the schedule is generated more, more quickly, uh, and it can be generated by anybody in the company, not just this one person who's doing it now, or more people than just one person. Re relevant information about the proposed schedule is easily accessible and straightforward to interpret, like how many people are in a certain class, um, uh, you know, uh, is it making a profit or not, um, the classes are fuller, um, and students wouldn't have to have their classes canceled at the last minute for low enrollment because only classes that were going to fill would be offered in the first place. Now there are a few techniques you may have just seen that we use that I want to highlight. One is where do you do your research? Where do you gather information? The bottom line here is use a diverse array and be creative with the sources that you use. Certainly you can do interviews or focus groups directly with the client about the system. You want to ask questions that generalize the problem, the why kind of questions, what do you hope to accomplish kind of questions. Uh, ex the questions that explore the as is, help you flesh out the current situation, and questions that help you understand the characteristics of the ideal situation. How would it be better than the as is? <clears throat> you can also uh, gather information from observations. So indirectly, you can go and watch uh, 
or in the case of like a website, you could be tracking information. Uh, you can do research uh, from the company. Uh, you can do research not from the company or the client that you're working with. Gather statistics or other publicly available information. And then from your team itself. You may have direct experience with the problem already, or you can go and directly experience the problem. For instance, for our, the course scheduling example, you could go and shadow the person scheduling the courses or actually be part of the team scheduling the courses to see the challenges and the frustrations and the difficulties that they actually face. The other thing you might have noticed was the use of diagramming. Now this doesn't have to be limited to just process modeling, but that's what we saw in the prior example. And the bottom line here, visual representations are really useful in not only the descriptive scenario, but also in the ideal situation. A process model is one type, just a step-by-step -step flowchart. Um, it's important to point out that the idea here is that the purpose of this isn't just to get the right model. There may not even be a right, right model or right diagram, but it's really to expose you and the client to what you don't know and need to find out about the current situation. Frequently clients, there may be different clients you're working with or people at the same company, and different people will have different perspectives on the same problem. Some takeaways from problem identification, don't accept the problem given to you by the client. Focus on asking questions that probe, is this the real problem? Use the as is and to be scenarios to learn more about the system and the values of the client. Get information from multiple sources and from the perspectives of multiple stakeholders. And utilize diagramming because it can be an important tool for the as is and the to be scenarios. Um, finally, the questions that you're going to go and ask the client should center on these kind of things. Is this really the problem? How does your current system work? And what are characteristics of the ideal scenario, the 2B? So that wraps up the video presentation on problem identification. Here we are back with the whole picture of the whole process. The next video will focus in on problem formulation and systems objectives and metrics and other way of formulating a problem once you've identified what you think the problem is.